Uh, for today's for presentation, tomorrow's presentation, there actually are two of us. So I know in our material it just has my name, so I'm John Lachman. Carolyn Boxmeyer is a psychologist from the University of Alabama, and she works uh, uh, as a psychologist in our Center for Prevention of Youth Behavior Problems, and uh, she and I do a lot of these kind of trainings together. So the show, we'll be tag teaming as we go along. So um, Coping Power as a program, this is the heart of what we're going to talk about. This is really a program that's um, co-developed with Karen Wells. Karen is a psychologist at Duke University Medical Center, and um, uh, she has a uh, background in parent training. Um, goes back to work with ADHD and uh, ODD and CD. So this uh, was an opportunity when I was at Duke for the two of us to collaborate together and put together this particular program. So our focus here is on children who have aggressive behavior and conduct problem behavior. So um, one of the, I've been in this for quite a few years actually. So it, um, I got my degree back actually in the 1970s and one of the very first areas that I started to work in both clinically and with research was with aggressive kids. And um, lucky for me, these are hard kids to treat because it means that I keep having to work with them and I keep having to think about what else could we do differently? Uh, how could we have an even stronger effect with them? Um, we know that unlike some other areas of disorder like depression, which is phasic, goes up and down, kind of on its own in many uh, cases, uh, aggressive behavior in children uh, does not go up and down very much. It tends to be fairly stable, especially for the really most aggressive individuals. And so when, they're, when you all are working uh, with these children in your settings, uh, you can kind of have this feeling like in this cartoon here. Uh, this could be the point at which the child is coming into your office and you're thinking, oh my goodness, what is this going to be like, you know? This is one of these kids who's really defensive and doesn't talk and all that. Or uh, even worse, it could be when the child left your office and uh, you had one of those uh, sessions where you're not quite sure uh, where things are going to go for this child. So um, how do we think about this? What does the literature say about the stability of aggressive behavior? So this is a uh, study from Richard Tremblay uh, in which they followed children in uh, Montreal from age 6 to age 15. And um, there were four uh, types of children that were identified through these analyses. And the, the largest type is actually right along the bottom. It's kind of hard to see that line. But those are kids who, at age 6, if you went into a first grade classroom, were not particularly aggressive, and they continued to be not particularly aggressive across time. Uh, there are two really kind of interesting groups right here that if you went into that first grade classroom and you were looking around at the 25 kids, you would notice that there's kids who, who actually are having some aggressive behavior with their peers or maybe with the teachers. And um, so if you were trying to screen them at that point, you might even screen for them. But over the course of time, they're going to naturally begin to desist. Uh, this group a little bit more than this group. This group kind of bumps up and then comes down. Um, why, why do you think that their trajectory begins to go down? What would be your guesses? What's that? Temperament. Temperament? Okay. Socialization with? With their peers in the classroom. Okay, socialization with, it, with their peers, within the classroom, adjusting to the environment. So it could be a variety of contextual factors, and we're going to talk about context in just a minute. So I think that does have a big uh, effect on whether children kind of continue on on this path or where they don't. Temperament is probably a really big deal. Um, so if there's some kids who are coming into this story um, really different than the other aggressive kids. And so there, uh, some kids are a little more uh, flexible and can just out, some kids less so. Uh, but the kids that we're really worried about are these in the red group up here. So about 10% of the sample were identified as being highly aggressive in first grade. And if you followed them all the way through uh, age 15, they were still showing significant problems relative to their peers, uh, significant problems at school and 
uh, other settings. Uh, it's kind of interesting to see what happens here. So they, they at age six, they start to get worse uh, up through uh, late childhood, um, and then and then they get better, uh, right about twelve, and then adolescence hits, right. So we were talking in the session yesterday about the uh, adolescence should be a diagnosis. So ad adolescence hits and it goes back up again. So it's we're aware those those of you working with. Uh, children in middle school are at that age, you're aware just that things stirring back up again. But the thing we're concerned about is for those kids and this red group, if we could begin to identify them and um, uh, treat them in this early period of time before adolescence, that can help to prevent some of the later uh, really serious, really severe antisocial behavior that can evolve once these kids get into middle school, once they get into high school. So. Um, when I'm thinking about these children, I'm always thinking about the developmental trajectory. We're going to work with somebody at a certain point in time. Uh, we want to uh, see them get better now, today. Uh, but in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking that I'm, what I'm trying to do is prevent something worse down the road. That's that's my big goal here. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Just for the clarification, I, I missed uh, the illustrator. But of those Well, the, the modal group is this one down here. So that's about 60% of the sample is the one that goes along the very bottom. And so therefore, in the three, three and three and a half, that's 15, you know, that's the, the, the highly enriched group is very advanced. So how, how dysfunctional is that? How, how problematic is that child? Right. So, right. There's no T score there, but these would be the kids who who represent the highest 10 percentile, basically. So, if you think about it that way, I mean, that's the easiest way to convert it. Now, not all of those um, children are involved in delinquency and substance use, but a good many are. You know, that's the risk factor notion that the risk factor remains. So. Okay. So, what I want to do. Um, in before break is to talk about um, the some of these risk factors that and active mechanisms that contribute to the development of aggressive behavior, and then um, in particular thinking about how they maintain that problem over time. Okay, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, evidence base and research results. So we'll probably get to that uh, hopefully before break as well. So when I think about um, when I'm going to talk here about risk factors, I'm going to talk about them in these five categories. Okay, I'm going to talk about risk factors that are there within the child. Then I'm going to talk about risk factors that are in the context around the child, so in their community, family, peer group. And then I'm going to return to the child again and talk about some other risk factors that are within the child. Um, there are some risk factors. Uh, this is not totally. Uh, exhaustive, so there are some things that we know are also related, but um, are not necessarily up here. So, uh, in this particular uh, discussion this morning, I'm, I'm not going to talk very much about media violence, although we know that that's also implicated. So, what do we know about the ch these um, risk factors that are present uh, within the child? So, I think a good um, thought uh, process to have at the moment is to think about. Um, What's one of the big hospitals here in Miami? Jackson, 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 Jackson Memorial. Jackson Memorial. So uh, right now at Jackson Memorial, there's probably a baby being born, right? Either right at this moment, a few minutes ago, a few minutes coming up. So right in this period of time that we're talking, there's a baby being born. Uh, cute little baby, crying, doing all that kind of stuff, right? Little baby. Uh, uh, we all look at and think, well, there's great hope uh, in this baby. However, uh, we know that that baby, even at that moment in time, already has some risk factors in place. So where do they come from? So some of these risk factors are risk factors are, that are coming from what happened during pregnancy. So uh, the clearest risk factors that we know about are things related to substance use, for example. 
So if the uh, mother uh, was ingesting substances, even things like uh, tobacco, even smoking, uh, that that has an effect uh, on the fetus, has an effect on the um, uh, cognitive functioning of that baby over time. And of course, it depends on what was the point in the nine months when the uh, substance was given, because it's going to have more effect on, on the cognitive development at different time periods, but it's going to have some effect. So that that is a uh, risk factor that's within the child that's already there. There could have been something, this baby that was born this morning right now, there could have been some problem during the birth process. So uh, one of my daughters was um, born breech birth, and so it was kind of a little scary when she came out, and she came out okay. But uh, certainly those kind of situations can occur where it doesn't turn out okay. And uh, so there can be oxygen deprivation during that uh, delivery process. And again, the, the worry about that, what does it do? Well, it affects the child's um, executive functions, their cognitive abilities in certain ways. And that carries on. You know, that you can't uh, just remove that uh, from, from the child. Um, there are also other factors like um, very severe nutritional deficiencies that can affect the parent. Um, and over the last decade, uh, we know a great deal, and you all know a great deal about uh, now about how genes affect children's behavior. Uh, you know, it's in Newsweek, it's in all of our publications, it's in our professional publications where we read about the research that's looking at how uh, genetic factors are being identified that are associated with a variety of difficulties in children, including antisocial behavior. So it's an area of growing uh, knowledge. It's still not complete. You know, I think we're still trying to know for sure exactly which genes are in play, and, and you need to have studies replicated, but it, it's clearly growing. And uh, we know that genes and some of these other risk factors have an effect on this child, this little baby that's just now born, but often, in concert with what's going on in the environment. And so this is a uh, study from um, Caspi that was published in 2002 in Science, and I think it's just such a nice illustration of how uh, this kind of interaction may work. So uh, following a sample of uh, children in Australia, or in New Zealand, it's the Dunedin sample, uh, they were examining the antisocial behavior, which is on the vertical axis here, of a group of boys, and they found that there was a certain genetic uh, uh, polymorphism that was related to being more aggressive. So if you had a gene that um, expressed low levels of the MAOA enzyme, the function of the MAOA enzyme is to help regulate neural transmitters as it's going along, so you, you don't have very much of that, you don't have as much regulation of your neural transmissions, uh, that if you had that gene, you were at risk, but um, where this risk was really expressed was if you look right here, so these are the uh, green line here are children who had that gene, so they have low levels of MAOA, but where it shows up is right up here, so if these children had low MAOA, and they had severe child maltreatment, then they had very high levels of antisocial behavior at a later point in time. If you had that same gene and had probable maltreatment, actually not different, and certainly not if there was no maltreatment. So this is a really critical concept, I think, in thinking about, again, this little baby that's just being born in terms of genetic risk factors and other risk factors, is that this this baby comes in with certain switches, risk factor switches, that are already there. But at the moment of birth, most of those are turned off, frankly. And it's only through their development that they get turned on, and they get turned on through some of these severe events in their environment. Right? So it's a combination of things. What's there at, that, uh, at the very beginning what happens later for these children. So what are some of the contextual factors we can think about? Well, the family probably comes to mind. So if you think about um, 
family risk factors, family risk factors that might contribute to aggressive behavior in children. What, what, what do you think about from your experience? Domestic violence. Mm -hmm. Mental illness on the part of the parents, right? Substance abuse on the part of parents, okay. Discipline style, how they're parenting the, the children, yeah. Parental anxiety. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, so family structure or something that uh, where you have a very large family, right? So, um, so th those are uh, actually all of those things that you've just mentioned. That you're going to find some set of studies <laughs> that would suggest that they are risk factor. Parental anxiety, actually a little less, but um, specifically. Parental depression, there's actually a, quite a bit, but anxiety is a little less, a little more varied. But otherwise, all of these things are things that we know uh, in various uh, studies are risk markers. They predict uh, children's aggressive behavior. Um, one of the things that we also know is that some of these factors, uh, high maternal dis distress in this case, is a high score on the BDI. So that means that the moms are more depressed, right? And if they experience high levels of parenting stress, uh, those factors are predicting uh, ch children's disruptive behavior across time. We also know that uh, poverty is related to children's uh, disruptive behavior. Poverty is an interesting risk factor because it's kind of related to everything else. Uh, so it, it correlates with almost everything. Uh, uh, and accounts in a, for a small amount of the variance just by itself going down. But the, um, the way that we've investigated this, the way the literature uh, kind of is interested in this, I think, is that if you think about maternal depression having an effect on children's uh, disruptive behavior, why is that? You know, why would being depressed as a mom lead your child to become more aggressive? Right? So um, the parent might not have the energy, might be lethargic, something like that. Is that what you mean? Yeah, right. Or the emotional ability to be able to manage. Okay. So they, so they can't jump in. They're kind of down. What else? Attention seeking behaviors. Yeah. How do you mean? In other words, like if there's a child that um, is not receiving proper attention from the mother. Oh, from the mother. Yeah, because of this. Yeah. Right. Yes. Right, so in response to that more withdrawn mother. Yep, yep, good, yeah. Coping behaviors are not learned very well. They're not modeled and they're not learned. Okay, so they may have certain skill deficits because uh, in their own adult interactions and because they're not showing those, then the kids don't display, yeah. Okay. Um, if you have Oh, yes, right, right, so, so you're raising a good point that we're, right, we're talking about um, kind of in this particular example, uh, maternal depression just being there, and it's kind of a, a characteristic of the parent, but you're, you're raising the good point that all of these things are bi-directional, and this mom might have gotten, a particular mom might have gotten more depressed because this was a difficult child to raise, and they got depressed, so that, that's an excellent point. But we're just talking about kind of at this at this slice in time, the mom is now depressed. Uh, what is it? So one of the characteristics of of depression, one of the symptoms, is irritability. Right. So um, some mothers that we work with, um, they they may manifest their depression not so much in being withdrawn, but in being highly irritable. Right? Little things just set them off all the time. And it's in part related to that depression. So, so there's various factors about depression, I think, that contribute to um, children's problem behavior. And um, I think what it does is it contributes to inconsistent parenting. So these are parents then who uh, maybe at moments in time actually do pretty well, but other times um, they're too lethargic or they're too irritable and then they don't parent well. So it's a very mixed picture. 
So in this study, in fact, we found that that's what we found was that the effect of um, maternal depression on child behavior was really mediated by the effect that it has on parenting. Um, and suggest, this would should suggest to me, incidentally, that if I was going to uh, do some intervention work, I really want to work with this because it's kind of proximal to the children's problem behavior. I want to work with parenting, obviously, right? But I need to pay attention to this too, at least be aware that it's out here, because it might be hard to change this if the mom remains depressed down here. So at least I have to think about that. Uh, this is uh, some of the results from the study, and I'm not going to, I'm just going to pass over this. Uh, this shows the mediational path. Uh, so another example of these kind of mediational processes are marital conflict. So conflict that's going on between the parents and the home. Uh, we know from the literature that it, uh, marital conflict predicts children's aggression. Uh, this is a set of analyses where we had data at three different time points each a year apart. And we found that the, uh, this is, uh, Rachel Baden was the author on this, lead author, that the more marital conflict that occurred at one point in time, these are children who are pre-adolescent, uh, in the next year, the parents were more aggressive in their parenting on the measures we had. And then in the year after that, the child was more aggressive. So there was this linkage. And um, so people talk about this as the spillover hypothesis, that um, when there's this kind of distress going on in the marital relationship, it spills over into how the um, parent is parenting the child, right? goes on to the child. So. Uh, so it's another factor. Again, we're very concerned about the parenting part, but there's these other, just like maternal depression, this might be operating, might make it hard to change uh, parenting. Okay, neighborhood context. Neighborhood um, is an area where uh, probably 15 years ago, those of us in psychology uh, didn't have much data about how does the community have an impact on the child. Uh, but in the last 15 years or so, there's been a lot of interest in that. Uh, we know that uh, things like neighborhood crime rates and uh, low social cohesion, low cohesion amongst the people in a neighborhood where, where somebody doesn't really know the name of other people on their block, uh, that that can uh, uh, lead to or predict uh, disruptive behavior in children. And there's some evidence from some of Danny Shaw's work that this starts uh, in particular during the middle uh, childhood period. So if you think about grades three, four, something like that. And it's at that point, um, you know, kids are more and more and more out in their neighborhood and being affected by their neighborhood. Uh, so in a, one study that we've looked at, we've been interested in how uh, neighborhood disadvantage as measured by uh, census information indicating um, how poor are the census tracts of the neighborhoods, the streets that children are growing up on, how that might predict uh, children's behavior. And we're interested in two types of behavior, uh, reactive aggressive behavior and proactive aggressive behavior. So I'm gonna come back to this. I'm gonna talk off and on here today about reactive aggressive behavior, proactive aggressive behavior. Um, any guesses about proactive aggressive behavior? It could be crime, not not only though. It's intrinsically initiated. Intrinsic. So it's um, so one way that people describe it, kind of along that terms, is it's more planful. You know, people know what they're doing. Uh, they've had actually some cognitive activity planning it out. So you're. It was in your forebrain, you were actually planning this act, whatever it might be. Uh, it could be something that you've planned even for a period of time. Um, and um, some people years ago would have talked about that this is kind of aggression that's emotionless. I don't know that it's really emotionless, but it's probably a different kind of emotion is really what it is. So reactive aggression in contrast would be not that, right? So that. Uh, reactive aggression is really more what probably most of you see in the kids you're working with on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's uh, something happens, so um, uh, I wanted that, uh, and you 
took the last one, and and uh, so I'm really upset that you were, you did that. And so, and I think you did that on purpose because you knew it was going to make me mad, and you were going to everybody else here wasn't going to think well of me because I couldn't get that last little thing there. Uh, so in reactive aggression, I'm responding to something that happened. Uh, I have a very strong amygdala or limbic system response. So my there's a psychophysiological response. Heart rate goes up. Everything goes up. Uh, I have a strong uh, emotional reaction, uh, typically anger, uh, at that moment in time. And then I do something very quickly. So it's very quick and impulsive. Right? So that, that's, the, that's a distinction. There is some evidence that would suggest, kind of related to your point just a minute ago, that if you were going to look at reactive aggression and proactive aggression and, and try to predict from that to later delinquent behavior, that actually proactive aggression predicts that more. So it's not just delinquent behavior, but it predicts it. So it's linked to it. So proactive predicts that more than the that, mm -hmm, Yeah. So, so planful. Yeah, so at the extreme end, right, if you think about the proactive aggression, what's an extreme end of those kids? So it's the callous, unemotional trait person or the sociopath. So it's somebody who's kind of scary to be around, right? They're going to engage in uh, potentially very violent behavior for their own gain. They get something out of it. That's why they do it. So uh, we collected data in this case in uh, Durham, North Carolina. So this is Durham County. And the little red dots represent where the families were. And um, these, this is a sample that was screened for being uh, high in aggressive behavior. And so they came from more from certain neighborhoods. So like there's a density of these red dots, for example, right in this area of Durham, which is uh, the, one of the poorer areas of uh, the city of Durham. And so what do we find? Well, we found, uh, in fact, that um, being in a more difficult uh, neighborhood did wind up predicting changes in behavior and aggressive behavior over time. So in this model, we're predicting uh, proactive aggression and reactive aggression in sixth grade. We enter in the fifth grade levels of that, so we're really predicting how much did you change, how much did you become more proactively aggressive, you know, in that sixth grade year. And if you were coming from one of these disadvantaged neighborhoods, uh, you were more likely to have that increase. And that wasn't as clear with reactive aggression. So it appears that this effect of being in these um, dangerous neighborhoods, difficult neighborhoods, has more effect on proactive aggression. Do you have any guesses on why that might be? Survival. survival? Mm -hmm. So how do you mean survival? Well, I'm going to attack you. Okay. Right. So it's something about um, interpersonal issues. There's other other people, yeah. Right, so it could be the norm, that there's um, a number of other uh, deviant individuals in that neighborhood. Uh, and that, right, so it could be brothers in a gang or, or people hanging out on your street corner. We do a lot of our data collection in our studies, in our longitudinal studies in people's homes. And so we have teams of interviewers going out. And um, one of the, the codes that we have for uh, interview teams is if you're seeing this cluster of people, especially males, hanging out on street corners, that's probably a better idea not to go in and do the interview that day. You know, that there, there's just the possibility that things might be going on in the neighborhood. And kids get exposed to that more and more frequently in those neighborhoods. Yeah? I would say that there's less bonding I think there is less bonding and attachment. I, that's the, the issue about social cohesion. We, we find that, that these families, that the parents tend not to have very much social support themselves from other people. And I think that makes uh, then the parent, it's harder for the parent to provide good attachment relationships, I think, for the child. So I think, I think there is an emotional part to that, too. They don't know them. That's right. I think that we look at this also that we have to be careful in terms of being judged. Right. I was kids and like mom dad. Yep. And um, very 
strong survival skills. Oh, yeah. Very, very intelligent. Oh, yeah. Could survive issues. Yep. Places no one else could. Yep. Assesses what can be done and does what needs to be done, what they feel yeah. needs to be done. So I think that this also eliminates some sort of judgment. No, I, I, you know, right. So what we have to, and we're going to talk about this in a few minutes, which we're going to talk about social cognition. And I think that there's some issues that we think of as being a bias or distortion in um, social cognitive processes that could well be there for adaptive reasons. You know, that it's an adaptive response, adaptive effort for the child to respond. But it still gets them in trouble. And, that, and that's where we get worried about, yeah, because of the consequences for the child. Does it come to the gender which way about boys? Uh, boys. Uh, boys always, you yeah. know. Uh, okay, so the, this neighborhood effect, as we were just describing it, as you were helping me to think about it, I think you're talking about norms, you're talking about um, kind of the threat from others, and it, a lot of that comes from the peers that are around these kids. And so we're very worried um, with aggression in children about the peer context. And uh, there are two aspects of the peer context that uh, we pay most attention to. The first of those has to do with how do, the peer, how do these children stand in their peer group? Uh, how well accepted are they? Um, uh, or conversely, how much are they disliked by their peer group? And so for, for many, for most aggressive children, um, they in fact are highly rejected by their peer group. They're highly disliked. So we go into classrooms and do sociometric surveys and we ask children to nominate who they like most and who they like least. So a lot of our aggressive kids get many, many, many like least votes. They're just, they don't have a real friendship ne network out there. There is an exception, and there are some aggressive kids who actually are very skillful, socially skillful, and do have friends. And they tend to be more of the proactive aggressive kids and less these reactive aggressive kids. Uh, we know that if you're, if a child, let's say in third grade, is um, aggressive and is also by that time rejected by their peer group. Those are additive risk factors and the risk for serious problems in middle school triple at that point. So if you're looking for two risk factors for children, if you're in a school setting, you're looking at these are two of the most um, strong, stable predictors of problems uh, for these children. We're also concerned about the deviant peer group. And that's the issue that comes up in these neighborhoods a lot. So uh, children's involvement with uh, deviant peers uh, contributes to a variety of negative outcomes, including substance use and uh, delinquency as children move into their uh, teen years. So this is a study where we were interested in looking at some of that. So again, up here, we're looking in fifth grade um, at children who are relatively proactively aggressive, aggressive, so high levels of proactive aggression, and um, also in fifth grade at, at high levels of reactive aggression. And we're interested in seeing how that predicts ultimately in ninth grade to increases in alcohol use, so beginning to use substances at a higher rate. And in these particular analyses, we're controlling for eighth grade alcohol use, so it's kind of the change that begins to take place, you know, once kids move into that level. And a little bit different paths. There's prediction from both being for both the proactive and reactive kids, but a little bit different pattern. So for proactively aggressive kids, um, by eighth grade, uh, they tend to gravitate towards deviant peer groups. So associating with peers who are delinquent. So it's a deviant peer group. And once that happens, then their likelihood of moving into increased alcohol use, substance use goes up. So it's the proximal predictor. So for reactive aggressive kids, we also see this issue about peer delinquency, but they get there in a different way. So these are children who back in fifth grade actually were rejected by their peers. So they were rejected by their peers, but um, they still have this very human need to affiliate with peers. So that doesn't go away. Just because uh, most of the people around me don't like me, uh, I'm still wanting to uh, have have that connection with others. So a real um, dangerous time for these children is when they then make this transition to the middle school years, uh, especially if there's a separate 
middle school they go to or junior high school because suddenly now there's this whole group of new peers that are not part of this group that's been rejecting them and there's new opportunities to develop connections with peers and who do you make connections with but kids like themselves who are also rejected and have this propensity for deviant behavior so the so the odds uh, mean that they move into this uh, delinquent deviant peer group. They tend to be kids that are more on the periphery of the groups. Uh, these kids tend to be more the leaders of the group. So, you know, but they're all, they get involved. And um, so one of the most um, worrisome risk factors of, of all the ones we've talked about today uh, is this, is getting involved with deviant peers. Um, if that happens, the child's risk rate for subsequent very serious antisocial behavior just uh, skyrockets, just huge. So if I'm working with a 10-year-old child, 10-year-old boy, and he's pretty oppositional, uh, not very much fun to be around with as a therapist, uh, it's a real struggle, we're working, um, he picks up a few skills, he's going along, but if he doesn't move into a deviant peer group, I'm all yeah, right. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay. I can tolerate some of the other stuff as long as that movement into that uh, peer context doesn't occur. So that, that that's such a strong predictor, right? So you want to have an effect on the other things too. Uh, so what happens? So we've we've got this again. If we go back to this early point where we were talking about the the baby that's born, comes in with certain risk factors, they're exposed to a neighborhood, they're exposed to a family, exposed to peer groups. And what emerges out of that is, is another layer or set of individual level risk factors inside the child. And if you're working with children in that are third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, uh, this is really what you see, this is what you know. It's how they think about their world, how they, how they come to process their world. And these are, in fact, a, a lot of what I do uh, treatment around or intervention work around. It's what, what emerges. So, egg. This stupid toaster burned my toast. Look at this. My toast is charred to a black cinder. I can't eat this. It's ruined. Ruined. And so mom comes along and says, so stick in another piece of bread and watch it this time. Calvin says, are you suggesting that this appliance didn't aggravate me with malice aforethought? Right? That this toaster meant to do it. Right? This toaster was out to get me, out to burn my toast. Right? So in that sense, we could say that Calvin has a hostile attributional bias towards toasters. Right? He thinks that toasters are out to get him. Um, so for our kids, we're not so worried about toasters unless they're picking up the toasters and throwing them at people, which they might do. But it's more when they begin to do that with people around them. where So they have a, a, dip, a kind of a funny encounter with somebody. They think, eh, you know, I think you're trying to do something to me here. I think, I don't, you know, I'm not sure what you're doing. So it's kind of like a uh, small version of paranoia. It's a, it's a good way to think about it. They're just children who are very uh, sensitive. So we know from uh, research literature that uh, aggressive children, and especially those reactive aggressive children, have difficulty at the first two stages in social information processing, and that's picking up cues around you and then interpreting those cues as uh, being either benign or hostile or neutral. So they tend to make errors at this point. And part of the reason why they make errors is they're paying so much attention. They make errors at step two because they're paying so much attention to uh, very, in some cases, subtle hostile cues at step one. There was a question? Yes, sir. Yeah, so, so really we're uh, talking about the children in terms of their, their behavior, their functional behavior. In terms of diagnosis, a good chunk of these will be ADHD. Or, or if not diagnosed as ADHD, they're you know, very impulsive and hyperactive. A lot of hyperactive behavior. And we have, and we, we really don't exclude, so in the studies that we do, we really don't exclude children. So many of the kids also have other uh, comorbid conditions, um, uh, including depression, anxiety. Uh, 
when we talk a little bit later about the groups and the intervention that we form, um, we are careful about excluding children who are uh, intellectually functioning at a much lower level than the other kids in the group because that makes um, they're it's very hard for those kids to work in the group. And then uh, uh, we've often not included children if they're pretty clear ASD kids. So if they're at the autism that they display. We've taken a few Asperger level kids and kept them in, but um, kids who are more severe uh, wouldn't be in the intervention. We're seeing a lot of kids in our clinic who are interpersonally aggressive, but they also just have all these different meltdowns all the time. Does, do you feel like these skills generalize across the spectrum of autism or is that just sort of getting angry and losing it? Right, they just lose it, yeah. So um, once we get into the program, we're gonna talk about different program elements. So if there was a child like that, not very, so the, the picture is that there's not a lot of interpersonal difficulties, but they do have these kind of meltdowns. Uh, the portion of the program that deals with anger management would be, um, is what I would pay attention to with that child. Um, although I would also imagine that some of the social problem solving skill training could be relevant because there might be ways that they're getting themselves into frustrating situations. So it may not be fighting with peers, but something else is going on. So that's another whole set of issues that I hope we'll be able to get into as we're talking about in the program is, you know, this is a manualized program. We've got lots of stuff. It's all packed with all kinds of things. But in fact, the particular child or group that you're working with is a particular child in a particular group. And um, as you get to know this kind of program, you may well realize that there's certain parts of the program that are more relevant or important for that child. Yeah. Right. It, it could well be. That, that's a good point. So here, I, I think I've got another slide here. No, I don't have it. But uh, uh, I don't think it shows up here. Uh, there's another cartoon. This is this is a Wendy Silverman thing. There's another cartoon that I have that I show sometimes, but I don't I don't have it in this set here. But uh, uh, essentially, it's these two uh, kind of explorers who are on in Africa, and they see this or somewhere in the Amazon or somewhere, and they they see this stake in front of them with a, a skull on top of it, and uh, so the one guy turns to the other and says. Uh, I think it means welcome, stranger. And, and um, so what's, what's the problem there is that this person doesn't have adaptive skills, right? They don't, they don't know to pay attention to threats in their environment, right? So the flip side is that for many of the kids that we do work with that begin to develop these kind of hostile attributional biases, it's because they have threats in their environment. So if you're a child growing up and you're coming home, uh, after school, your dad comes in, been out drinking. Uh, when he's out drinking, um, you know he he begins huffing around a lot and talking real loud and kind of banging against things. And um, if you happen to be in that room with him, you're going to get banged against. You know he's going to whack you upside the head and knock you around. So what's adaptive for me at that moment is to notice small cues about my dad that would suggest to me that he might be about to lose it, right? So the way he flushes or the whatever, the way his eyes get or something. And I, I can get really good at it, means I don't get tossed around at home, but it means I may pay too much attention to those cues then when I get into school or into other settings where that's, it's not as likely that somebody's gonna threat, throw me around like that. So all of a sudden I'm looking for eyes or I'm looking for certain tones of voice and uh, not paying attention to the other cues, which are you know, more benign. So there is, I think this is a real key issue, this whole issue that's been raised a couple times about how the adaptiveness of these uh, distortions, uh, it may be, have been adaptive originally, may have a survival function even in the moment, but we're hoping that in some of the settings they're in, such as the school, they can learn to not engage them. So they have to learn uh, something like code switching. Is that what you were thinking? Yeah. And that's exactly what I was going to mention is that it's helping them find flexibility to 
instead of generalizing those to every situation to say, I right. have to have a strategy in this environment, yep. it's, this, it's this set of rules, and this environment's this set of rules. That's exactly right. And so, so if you think about that, what you're just saying, it means that these are children who have other risk factors, right, and have various limitations, and they're going to have to work harder than the kid next to them to manage the behavior, right? So, you know, in terms of, it's so easy to have empathy, I think, for the situations that these kids get themselves into. So that, yes? How do we identify the group that we work with? So for the intervention research um, that I'll talk about in a minute, we go into school settings and we identify the top 20 to 30 percent of children in terms of their aggressive behavior. So it's kind of moderate to high aggression. And then we, we work with them. Uh, the program has been used in clinical settings, though, as well, and um, outpatient clinics uh, primarily. But uh, we can talk a little bit about that. Okay. Uh, in, Various things in different studies, but usually we do use a rating, behavior rating system, and the teacher will rate all the children in their classroom. So what we've used in some recent studies is a um, measure by Dodge and Cooey, which is a measure of reactive and proactive aggression, six items, fairly brief. And because we're interested in reactive and proactive aggression, you know, it's a good screen for us and helps us to, yeah. Is there a mix in terms of Uh, not purposefully, no. So, so usually we go into a community and we get as many schools as <laughs> will participate. <laughs> and so we're not purposefully. Now, uh, one of the large studies, this is one it, I mentioned yesterday and might get back to today, is the, uh, it was a large field trial. And so we actually went out to 57 schools in Alabama. Um, nearly 40 of them were in the Birmingham City School District. So that's a certain uh, public school district where there's a lot of poverty uh, very difficult neighborhoods that kids come from. So, uh, so kids um, at the first couple of steps of social information processing are um, taking in information, they're uh, uh, interpreting that in some way. We know that these steps actually are, uh, they're not just cognitive, so they're also, else. so we, one of my uh, graduate students a few years ago did a study where um, she had um, aggressive and non-aggressive uh, boys, pre-adolescent, come into the laboratory. They were told that uh, uh, in a few minutes you're going to have an interaction task with another child who's going to be coming here. And they hooked up the children to uh, blood pressure cuffs so you could, that would measure minute by minute what the child's uh, heart rate was. And then um, collected information about kind of how the child typically has this hostile attribution strategy or not. So there's some vignettes that the children would fill out. And then the experimenter would um, uh, go out of the room for 30 seconds and come back in and say, you know, this other kid today is really mad. He's really upset. He said he's going to really smash somebody. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, and here's some more papers for you to fill out. And, um, and so the experimenter goes out again. And so what happens in response to that kind of possible priming is that the child's hostile attributions go up, which we know. So as you get primed, you know, that tends to happen. But that was correlated with this increase in heart rate. So the correlation of 0.4 as you're, as you're beginning to have this tendency to think more that other people are out to get you, your body is reacting as well. So, you know, cognitions and physiology go together, and um, the implication for intervention is that if I have only a cognitive intervention that's working inside kids' heads, that's not going to be sufficient, right? Because part of the reaction is physiological. So you have to have an intervention that also deals with how kids are managing their, their physiology in the moment. But as they come out of that, then they're thinking, they're at the point in this kind of model where they would be thinking about, okay, what's my goal and what are my strategies? What could I uh, do in this situation? And aggressive children tend to have strategies that are more dominance and revenge oriented, and they generate less competent uh, problem solutions. So this is a, um, 
measure that we would uh, use in some of our research, but we also use it clinically. Uh, so it's a problem-solving measure for conflict. It has a set of vignettes. And this is one of the vignettes. So some of Ed's friends borrowed his soccer ball during the lunch period, but they did not return it. When Ed came out of school at the end of the day, the other boys had already started playing with it again. Ed was supposed to go right home after school, and he wanted to have his soccer ball back. So that's the kind of the problem stem, right? So uh, that's my ball. Those kids have it. The story ends with Ed walking home with the soccer ball. What happens in between Ed not having a soccer ball and later when he walked home with it? So that's the problem. That's the ending. So it's kind of a means end story, but we're asking kids to fill in the middle. What is it? What strategies could Ed use uh, to get his ball? So what, what are they? Grab the ball. Yep. Okay. What else? Threaten them. Yeah. Do you have a favorite way? No, I'm sure you know. <laughs> Ask them for it. Okay. What is that? Aggression. So, popping them or something like that, fighting, yeah, grabbing them, throwing them to the ground. Any any other? Tell, oh, the, teacher. tell the teacher. Okay. So those are are some of the common ones. So, what we do. Um, <clears throat> If we're doing research, we have um, some of our staff trained up so they can be reliable at coding exactly these kind of things that you've just said, and they would fall within these kind of categories. Uh, clinically, I think it's important to do the same thing. I think it's important to listen to these stories the kids are telling us about the social problems they have and to categorize what kind of solutions do they typically use, because it's going to be a clue. It's going to tell us what to do in intervention. So um, out of the things that were talked about, um, so asking the kids to give the ball back would be, in this kind of model, verbal assertion. So verbal assertions are very simple, straightforward um, requests or telling the other people what, you're, what you need. So you're just putting in words what you need. What's the negative? Yeah, at this point, I'm going to ignore that, but it, there could be... Uh, for coding purposes, we sometimes separate it out, but uh, I think here I'm just going to leave, just talk about it in general. Direct action. Um, so we had one, one of these examples was direct action. Does anybody? Hmm? Take the ball. Yeah, so taking the ball is direct action. So taking the ball uh, in this kind of uh, way of thinking about it is different than physical aggression. That's the hitting the kid, right? So what happens for many of these kids is um, uh, there's an instrumental gain. So that somebody has something and I want it and I take it, right? So it's not necessarily physically hurting the other person, that your goal is just to get that thing. So that's direct action. Hope seeking, teacher. Uh, Non-confrontational, we didn't have. Physical aggression, we did. Verbal aggression, uh, threatening. Yeah, so we did pretty well. Uh, bargaining and compromise. Bargaining and compromise are both higher level uh, skills because you have to take into account the other person's perspective and negotiate back and forth. And um, just developmentally, we would see more bargaining and compromise on this kind of task as kids get older, as they move into adolescence. So pre-adolescence, it's uh, even the typically developing kids don't have a huge amount of it. Would you consider that, I guess, being reactive? Which one? Oh. Well, well, actually, the the story as it's told, it could go any way. You know, it could go any direction. So it could be reactive aggression. It could lead the child to get offended and to respond back, which would be maybe physically aggressive, but maybe not. You know, they they the child might actually just ask for the ball back, in which case they're not being reactively aggressive. So it could it really could go various ways. It could be a stimulus for aggressive behavior, maybe not. And that's why we're interested in this. We're interested in knowing kind of this, this range of ideas that kids can think about. Do they think about the range? And uh, if not, if they're only thinking about one type of solution, what time, what, what do they, what's in their head, right? What, what, what do they come up with all the time? And that's gonna, if it's only one thing, then that, when I do problem solving, I'm gonna try to expand that envelope with them. Um, so if you think of these things, let's think about the um, 
a fourth grade boy who's referred to your office uh, because of some trouble with other kids. He's been fighting some on and off. Uh, which of these problem solving categories do you think he either has, is likely to generate too much of or too little of? Verbal and physical aggression, okay. What else? Direct action. Anything else? Seek help, maybe. Okay, so for the, the most consistent things that we've seen that go across to other the laboratories that look at this, at this pre-adolescent age, is uh, direct action, too much direct action, too little verbal assertion, right? And the interesting thing about direct action and verbal assertion that those are both strategies in which the child's trying to solve the problem, right? But with verbal assertion, they're putting their effort in words, right? And uh, direct action, they're just doing it. So that's, that's the garden variety default thing that we would see with uh, pre-adolescent aggressive kids. It's gonna vary by child, but that's very common. And so that means, in general, when I'm doing problem-solving training with kids, I'm trying to get them to use more verbal assertion and do role playing with them about how they can do that effectively. Because you know, being assertive, it's a real skill to do it appropriately. Uh, and that as they begin to do that more, I think that their direct action will begin to decrease, will begin to go down. Uh, physical aggression shows up, but often not right as a first choice. And we're gonna have an example of that in just a minute, I think. So this, um, we've used this kind of thing in uh, clinical settings. This was when I was at Duke and was at the outpatient clinic there. We had a conduct disorder program. James is a 12-year-old who came in. And so in his response, he says, Ed went up and acted like he was fixing to play with the soccer ball, but took the ball and walked away with it. So if we were going to be coding that, we would say that's a direct action. Okay. Okay, James, thanks. Uh, do you have any other ideas for what Ed might do? He could have just took the soccer ball without playing with him. How would we code that? Direct action. Well, great, James. Any more ideas about what Ed could do? Well, he could have went home and next morning seen them playing with it and gone up to them and taken it without asking. So how would we code that? More direct action. More direct action. Any other ideas, James? Well, next morning, if it's in the locker, he could have went in the locker and took it out. So another idea, yeah, another direct action. So, so James is kind of the, is the classic here. You know, it's a child who actually is being cooperative to the task. He's being responsive. Uh, he's actually kind of creative within that range, but everything is direct action. Right? That's, that's his way of handling it. So he'd be, a, you get this, you say, okay, I know what I'm gonna do with him. I know where I'm going and problem solving. Um, David is an 11 year old. He told them to give him back his soccer ball so he could go right home. So we would code that as verbal assertion. And we say, why is David even in my office? You know, David really knows what he's doing. So he's, I don't know why he's here. Any other ideas, David? Well, he could have started a fight. <laughs> so um, that's another pattern that is not uncommon. So we'll see kids who actually do have some kind of competent first idea. But if it doesn't work, they get quickly frustrated, they resort to this, they escalate very quickly to a very physically aggressive solution. So here, if you're thinking about what you do with this child in, in treatment, one of the big goals is to help them develop uh, better uh, abilities to manage their frustration and to be able to be persistent in continuing to problem solve around less problematic uh, solutions. Finally, this is Mark, a 16-year-old. He was referred in by the uh, court system uh, when we assessed him. So he said, they won't let Ed have the soccer ball, right? So went to the principal, told him the situation. He went back to the kids and told them to give Ed soccer ball back. And if they messed with Ed, they'd be expelled from school. See, Ed is the kind of person who doesn't like violence or to fight and has values and stuff. So how would you code that? It's help-seeking, right? I mean, pretty straightforward help-seeking. 
What's that? <laughs> yeah, you were, you're waiting to see, right? I, we, could, we could predict. So, so it's help-seeking. It kind of has this element of wanting to get the other kid in trouble, right? Get the other kids expelled. And, and that's not uncommon. So the, to the degree that the kids we work with seek help, it's often to somehow get somebody else in trouble. You know, that it's not just help-seeking like we think about it. What do you think about this last sentence? See, Ed is the kind of person who doesn't like violence or to fight, has values and stuff. Court referred, right? Hmm? Court right? Yeah, he's court referred. I call that BS number one. Okay. <laughs> what he said number two. Well, that kind of social bias. Well, he knows what you're expecting to say, so yeah. Right, and he's so he's he has actually, if you think about perspective taking, he understands what we're up, up about, right? He's trying to play the system a little bit. Is that right? Okay. Right. So, so at least it's it's a it's a good verbalization. So we asked Mark then. Okay, what's another thing you could do? So, what's your prediction? Start a fight. Start a fight. Okay. Well, he could have went up there, say, if he had a knife or something, he could have cut one of them up. <laughs> so, you know, if you think about the nature of this kind of story, that's extraordinary, right? I mean, that's an extraordinary level of violence for this kind of thing. So uh, it's fairly alarming. You know, you don't see that kind of thing very much. And uh, by the way, we would code that as physically aggressive right there. That's how we would code it. Uh, uh, but it says something about the, the um, you know, his, his, and he's also that he's willing to give up the BS stuff, you know, <laughs> obviously. He's willing to kind of do that. But this is a child who, a uh, 16-year-old who was um, in trouble with the courts because he had severely assaulted a homeless guy uh, trying to rob the person of some stuff. And the homeless man had to go to the hospital and uh, was pretty badly hurt. So he's kind of a, so this, this is a kind of story that begins to feel kind of like that callous, unemotional trait psychopathic, sociopathic kind of person, right? Uh, kind of manipulative, playing the game, really dangerous, uh, doesn't care too much. Another idea, Mark? Well, he could have come over to the school with his mom. His mom could have got the ball back. So how, how would we code that? Help seeking. Any thoughts about that as a solution? You think it is or isn't? I think it is. It's going to give him a sense of empowerment. So the, one of the odd things for me about it, whenever I think about this, is you know this is a 16-year-old kid, right? And he's going to get his mom to come, you know, and after get the <laughs> after no, that. He's got. Yeah, that's right. He's going to bring his mom. Ah, I see. No, no. He's going to go get his own mom. Oh, okay. Have his own mom come. Right. So I'm going to get my, my, my ally. Right. So if you, um, all of you are good clinicians, and you have your clinical ears pop out, right, when you hear things. And so that's something that you would, hmm, you know, you go, hmm, what's that about? And so it turns out that in, within this family, the mother was incredibly forgiving of his very antisocial behavior. She thought that, in fact, it was probably the homeless guy's fault, you know, that, that uh, so that, she did not ascribe responsibility to her son, and he knew that. So it was part of part of his uh, style, and part of what contributed to it. So in this in this particular case, what you would take away from it is uh, uh, this kid probably needs more than just what we have. We can do what we're going to do, but he's going to need more than that, right? And actually, even some family work would probably be a good idea here, or get to know this mom uh, a little bit better. Uh, in terms of the program, the part that's going to make the most difference for this kind of kid is actually not so much the anger management work or emotion management. It's his ability to become clearer over and over and over again about consequences of his behavior. So to the degree he begins to make connections like that, then rationally he's going to begin to make somewhat different decisions. Right? So, that, so the goal there is, is really... What, what kind of uh, decisions are you going to make? And I think so, yesterday you did mention that exploring consequences is one of the best ways yep. of instilling problem solving. 
Yep, absolutely. So I've, I've become a real believer in that, and exactly for these reasons, that it's that's the part of the program where I uh, really want to emphasize. So um, we're at the break point, and so we have, what, 15 minutes? Is that? Till, okay, till 10.30, 10 minutes, right? What? 10 minutes? Okay, so 10 minutes, and um, back at 10.30.